Christ's brethren slain. Well, yesterday we began our journey through this pagan Roman Empire and we began with the 84-year window of peace where our brothers and sisters in this time of relatively political, military, economic stability in the Roman Empire where our brothers and sisters would bend their tongues as bow benders and out of their mouths would go the sweet words of the covenant. They would go forth conquering and to conquer. And the events of the work that began in that first seal would ripple down through to the sixth seal when the pagan empire would be so weakened that it would be an ease, relatively easy for Constantine to come and take that pagan Roman empire which we will consider God willing tomorrow and the day after. Well, from the relative time of peace, brothers and sisters, we then plummeted into this 31 years of civil war where the Machaira, the badge of the rider, would do its work very, very well. And rivers of blood would flow through the streets of Rome as 2,000 a day were perishing in that city. It was awful. And here were men that sat upon the throne who boasted in the Pax Romana. We guarantee you peace. But they themselves, through their scrabbling for power, through bloodlust, they themselves were taking away the very thing within which they boasted. And we had those five emperors in the second seal, Commodus, Pertinax, Julian, Septimus, Severus and Gita. Well, brothers and sisters, things would get a lot worse in the Roman Empire, the pagan Roman Empire, before, before things ever got better, if they ever would, for the pagans. And so now we turn our attention to the third seal, and this, of course, would be 24 years of injustice. And we don't have five emperors on this occasion, but rather four. We have Caracalla, Macrinus, Elagabalus, and Severus Alexander. Therefore, we begin our session this morning with reading from Revelation 6, and verses 5 through 6. And we read these words. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third living one say, John, enthusiastically, energetically, John, stand over here. You, as part of the cherubim, be a spectator. And look at the object. And the object before us is the pagan Roman Empire. And we've now moved into its particular phase whereby there would be awful famine and disease as a result of that terrible taxation that would be brought upon this empire. And therefore I beheld, John said, I was invited to come and see, and I did. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat upon him had a pair of balances. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living ones say, a measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. That's an amazing statement, brothers and sisters, an amazing statement. You wait until we unpack that little verse and see how amazingly, historically, the history is poured into the mould of God's prophetic word. Well, we read, therefore, that I heard a voice. And it would be, brothers and sisters, in this black horse period. So we ask the question, is black a fitting colour or a fitting description of this part or time of the pagan Roman Empire? Well, you know, we could go to a couple of Old Testament quotations Job 30 will do. In fact, if we went to Job 30, which time won't permit us to do so, brothers and sisters, when you go to Job 30, you could not read that chapter. Coming away having read Job 30, elated with a spring in your step, you could not read that chapter. Walking away delighted and enthused. It's an awful chapter. Job says in chapter 30, my skin is black. And there are words that surround that expression, mourning, weeping, sorrow. And all the way through Job 30, Job says, before this I had honour, but now I'm in despair. Before young people came to me with respect and they said, Uncle Job, we know you're a man of wisdom and we'd love to talk with you. Are you all right, Uncle Job? But then he says, now the young people are writing taunting songs about me and they're singing them. He says in that chapter, before I could run with the young people, I could leap like a gazelle. 
I could go in the morning and open up the blinds and bathe in the morning sun and suck in the morning air, but now I'm at the door of death. I might as well go to God. And when he went to God, brothers and sisters, he saw God as brutal. All I might as well give up and die. And therefore he says, my skin is black. Awful chapter. And therefore, in Job chapter 30, you read about the context of mourning, of distress, of intense depression of mind. And that, brothers and sisters, is exactly what the atmosphere or the environment or the scene <clears throat> of this third seal is all about. The, the provinces of Rome were about mourning and distress and intense depression of mind. Why? Well, it was all about the balance, as you see. Because the one that sat upon the horse had a pair of balances and it was all about brothers and sisters, not justice. It was all about injustice. Do you know Rome boasted in the Pax Romana <clears throat> in seal two? Rome also boasted in equity. And therefore, it was not uncommon for our brothers and sisters <clears throat> in the time of the Apostle John to see coins like this, you see. You have the balances. You have the balances. You have the balances all through those coins. In fact, equitus, the personification of fairness. Equitus, the Latin word from which we get the word equity. There was no equity in Rome, brothers and sisters. No equity at all. All these emperors thought about was themselves. Who cares about the population in Rome as long as I can live in a luxurious life form, as long as I can pay my army to do what I want to do. A shocking period, brothers and sisters, it was. And therefore... We read with respect to the seal that I heard a voice in the midst of the four living ones say, a measure of wheat for a penny and so on. Now let's be very careful here. When it says there, a voice, we're not talking about the people in the provinces who were saying, oh, this is awful. This is awful. This, they weren't lamenting, the people in the provinces, about what was happening to them. This is not the voice of the people crying to their pagan gods. This voice is the voice of the judiciary. These are the lawmakers. And the voice that went out was a law of tax. Now, you know, you get that, brothers and sisters, as an example from Ezra 1 and verse 1. And you read these words, now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of Yahweh by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, Yahweh stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom. And he put it also in writing, saying, now in your margin of Ezra 1 and verse 1, you'll find that made a proclamation in your margin is caused a voice. So you see, from the judiciary in the times of Cyrus, a voice went out. And that is exactly what we have here in this third seal. Therefore, this voice were the decrees and the laws that were issued and carried out by those in authority. Now, brothers and sisters, every now and then, you read a little verse or a portion of a verse couched in other verses that really encourages you and gives you a lift. There is one such verse right here. This awful decree of taxation, this awful burden that would fall upon those who lived in the Roman Empire, in the midst of that, brothers and sisters, the record says, I heard this voice, this taxation decree, but it went out in the midst of the four living ones. That is so encouraging. Do you know why? Because no matter where taxation went, and taxation went everywhere throughout the Roman Empire, it tells us, brothers and sisters, that wherever taxation went, our brothers and sisters were there. There are our brethren and sisters, those who are living God in their life. These are the cherubim. These are those who are manifesting the Father in their life, which means that the 84-year window of bow bending was so effective that by the time we get to the third seal, our brothers and sisters are all over the empire. What a lovely thing that is. What an encouraging thing that is, that God was at work. The angels were at work and encouraging and supporting our brothers and sisters. Well, we read this statement, this measure of wheat for a penny, three measures of barley for a penny, but don't act unjustly by the oil and the wine. Now look, you can't pick up a history book and say, well, who said this? Who made that quotation? Was it 
Caracalla or was it Macrinus or was it Elagabalus or maybe Severus Alexander? Couldn't have been Commodus because he was too busy being Hercules. He wouldn't have said anything that was sound or interesting. So here, brothers and sisters, we've got a law, but this is not something that the emperor said. This is a sign law. This is a statement put there by the revelator to show us, as an example, how bad this time period of the Roman Empire was. I'll give you an example. We won't turn there, but if you were to go through Exodus chapter 4, all the way through Exodus chapter 4, you would hear the words voice, speech, speak, mouth, voice, speech, mouth. And intertwined through that, you will see this is a sign. Your mouth will be a sign. So all the way through Exodus 4, you get this idea of sign and speech, sign and mouth, very much after the same manner here in Revelation chapter 6. Do yourself a little favour and work through Exodus 4 and do the comparison, you see, of this particular verse in Revelation 6. It will open up some very interesting doors for you with respect to your Bible study. Well, brothers and sisters, what does this mean? A measure of wheat for a penny, three measures of barley for a penny, but don't hurt the oil and the wine. If you were to see this in the Greek, you would read it this way. A coinix of wheat, a denarius. Three coinixes of barley, a denarius. So you see, barley was the poor man's food. You get more barley for your money than you would wheat, you see. But the oil and the wine, in the Greek, thou mayest not act unjustly by. Now, what does this mean? Well, brothers and sisters, if you know something about the planting and harvesting calendar of Israel, you will know that they harvested the barley and the wheat first. And then later on in the harvesting cycle, they harvested the olives and the grapes. So, what we have here presented is a 24-year period of a planting and harvesting cycle. Or there were farmers. They weren't farmers with olives and grapes and wheat and barley. They were tax farmers in the Roman Empire. Quite a fitting little symbol we're using here. But this is it. In the beginning of the planting cycle, if you like, in the beginning of this 24 years, things were awful. Awful. At the wheat and the barley, beginning of this harvesting period. But as you get toward the end of this 24 cycle, symbolically represented here in Revelation 6, things would be eased. Don't hurt or act unjustly by the oil and the wine. Can you see what God's doing? He's taking us from the beginning of the 24 year period and moving us through to the end and things get dramatically better. See how that works historically, brothers and sisters. Well, many of us would know this, of course, with respect to a denarius. We would, we would be very familiar, for instance, with Matthew chapter 20 and verse 2, where if you work for a day as a labourer, you would receive a denarius. So think about that. I've worked all day, I receive a denarius. When I get my penny or my denarius, I'm able, brothers and sisters, to buy food that would support a man of moderate appetite for one day. So I'll get my penny, I buy my meal for one day. Now I reckon that in America, very much like Australia, roughly you would probably earn, oh I don't know, $100 a day for a labourer, unskilled labourer, $100 maybe. Let's Let's use $100. So you get $100 and with that $100 you buy enough to sustain you with moderate appetite for a day. If you had a wife and two children, you would have, well, $100 for your wife. You would have, well, let's split it, $50 each for your children. $300 a day for just enough to sustain you of moderate appetite. Multiply that by seven days in a week and you've got a grocery bill of $2,000. One hundred dollars for pretty much one meal a day, two thousand one hundred dollars. That is how bad this taxation was. I want to show you now how historically that was reduced 
dramatically from 2,100. If you wanted to eat more, well, be prepared to pay $3,000 or $4,000 a week for your grocery bill. Well, brothers and sisters, toward the end of the cycle, as we have intimated, it's going to get better. There's going to get relief, you see, from the last crops, as it were, or the last emperor. Let's see how this panned out with respect to history. Now, here we are. We've got these four emperors, Caracalla, Macrinus, Elagabalus, and Severus Alexander. And we have these 24 years of famine, and this would be a period of heavy taxation. Well, brothers and sisters, Caracalla. We've had the fruitcake, Commodus, who was the first emperor of the second seal. This fellow was not a fruitcake. He was an absolute animal. If you walked up to him and said, you're a brute, he would say, well, you thank you very much. You have a nice day too. And on his way he goes. He did not care, brothers and sisters. He reveled in the fact that he was an animal. He delighted in that fact. And they called him the savage beast of Orsonia. But I tell you this, this man, as brutish as he was, look at the brutality of the man. Now, there's Caracalla. There's his dad. I don't know whether you remember Septimus Severus. He was coming from the provinces. He was one of the generals that was marching on Rome because they, well, they cut Pertinax's head off, put it on a pole, auctioned the empire, cut Didius's head off, the old fellow that had all the money, and Septimus Severus was coming in to sort out Rome and get rid of the Praetorian Guard. Well, Septimus Severus was Caracalla's dad as was Gita. Gita and Caracalla were brothers. Caracalla tried to poison his dad several times. Didn't work. His dad got old, went to England. Caracalla did poison his brother. These two men ruled conjointly for a time. Caracalla and Gita absolutely hated each other. And they were frightened of each other. And when they met, they always met in public, and they always were surrounded by their respective bodyguards. Well, he was an animal, brothers and sisters, but I say this, even though he was an animal and a brute and a rogue and a ruffian, he wasn't interested in persecuting the brothers and sisters. All he was interested in was tax. Ta he was a tax madman. In fact, it was Caracalla, while listening to the people out of the provinces who said, we don't have to pay the tax of Rome because we're not part of the city. Caracalla said, I'll fix that. And so he extended the borders of the city of Rome to the empire. So he said, it didn't matter where you lived in the Roman Empire, you live in the city of Rome. Now pay your taxes. He didn't care about persecuting the brothers and sisters. Now that's interesting. Because, brothers and sisters, in the context, this is what you read with respect to Caracalla, the tax madman. LaRousse, in its historical writings, and page 217 and 218 says this, The growing cost of the armed forces and the inflation which accompanied it compelled the emperors to increase existing taxes and to invent new ones. Now listen to this. The voice went out among the four living ones. Right? Now listen to these words. Says the historian, The spirit of the times was, moreover, very susceptible to the message of Christianity which made great advances. Do you see that, brothers and sisters? There's the historian writing that. And God said, the voice of taxation, the burden of taxation, no one escaped. And wherever tax went, there were our brothers and sisters. And the historical writings say that, confirming if the Bible ever needed confirming that that was in fact the case. Well, brothers and sisters, Macrinus came on the scene he was the workmate of Caracalla. Well, he dealt with him. Macrinus bumped Caracalla off, as you would expect your workmates to do if they want to advance up the ladder of, of, um, of reputation. And then, brothers and sisters, the Roman world or the Roman people or the Praetorian Guards said, now look, we need morality back in the Roman Empire. So let's look for somebody who's got, well, reasonable morals. And they looked around and they went over to the east and there was a fellow over in the east called Elagabalus. He was a high priest of the sun. They brought him over thinking that he would bring some measure of morality to the empire. Brothers and sisters, this man was an animal. Commodus was a fruitcake. This man, Elagabalus, was a debauched sensualist. What this man did in private and in public shamed Hardened Roman soldiers. 
Roman soldiers out there in the province were embarrassed. Embarrassed. And you know what they did out in the provinces? You know what the hardened Roman soldiers must have seen in the provinces? And they were embarrassed by what that man did. He's got to go. And so they looked around for someone else that might bring some measure of morality, if you could have morality in a pagan empire. And they looked around, brothers and sisters, and they saw a young boy, 17, Alexander or Severus Alexander, and they brought him to the throne. And I'll tell you this, the first thing that Severus Alexander did when he came to the throne was reduce taxation, not by one thirtieth. He came in and reduced taxation to one thirtieth. Therefore, your grocery bill went from $2,100 to 70. And the Bible says, do not act unjustly toward the oil and the wine. Isn't that interesting? God just puts a little sentence there and says to us, do some homework, do some research, look at the way that I structure this book and look at the prophecies through which history is going to be poured. What an astounding thing, brothers. Well, that's the third seal. Four emperors. Five emperors here, five emperors here and four there. All things are going to get a lot worse, brothers and sisters. We're now going to enter into the fourth seal. No longer are we going to be looking at five emperors, five emperors or four emperors because by the time we come to the fourth seal, there are 39. And almost all of those 39 emperors and the would-be emperors along the way died violently. This is death. The rider is the name death. Well, brothers and sisters, we read these words. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard for the final time, John, this is the last time we're going to invite you to stand with us, because the object is going to change in the fifth seal. No longer in the fifth seal is the object going to be the Roman Empire. In the fifth seal, the object is going to be the brothers and sisters in Christ, you see. So the last invitation to John is, come and see. And John, in verse 8, looked and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat upon him was Death, and the grave followed with him. And power was given unto them, the grave and death, over the fourth part of the earth. Listen to the detail. To kill with a sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. God just doesn't say it's going to get worse, it's, and, things are, and things are going to happen so a lot of people die. God meticulously caused all of those words to be written out in such detail that would it mentally arrest our minds. Well, brothers and sisters, a pale horse. I think some of you would have this in your Bibles. It is the Greek word chloros, from which we get the word chlorophyll, the green substance that plants produce. So what we've got here is an old, shuffly, decrepit, skinny-breathed horse. And it's yellowy, pale, green, sickly colour. It's the kind of colour that some old people go just before they're about to die. Awful. And so, brothers and sisters, if Gibbon, the historian, were to give a succinct sentence to capture the spirit or the time of this fourth horse, what Gibbon would simply say, as he did, is this. The animating health and vigour of the empire were fled. Chloritic, the medical term for the colour that old people go just before they're about to die. Chloritic, chloros. Well, brothers and sisters, we read in the record with respect to the fourth seal that power was given to death and the grave over the fourth part of the earth. How accurate is the Bible? The fourth part of the earth? The fourth part of the Roman earth? What are we talking about? Well, do you know that Diocletian, who was the last emperor of the fourth seal, the first emperor of the fifth seal was Diocletian as well. Diocletian, the last emperor of the seal, actually divided his empire into a tetrarchy, into a rule of four, for ease of administration. And so therefore, Diocletian came on the scene, the empire was divided into four parts. Well, that's convenient, isn't it? Of course, God said a fourth part of the earth would be, would be, uh, would be judged. And so what we see here, therefore... Historically, brothers and sisters, there are the four parts and God is particularly in this verse singling out 
judgment to be brought home to the very heart and soul of the empire, right there, Italy, Rome. So the very heart and soul of the empire was going to be judged and once that collapsed like a domino effect, the other portions of the empire would likewise collapse and ready for the final overthrow of the sixth seal. Well, brothers and sisters, there are our detailed words. To kill with a sword, with hunger, with death and with the beasts of the earth. We've already alluded to the fact that this sword is the Romphaea, different from the Machaira. We also made mention of the fact that there was this fellow called Maximin, who was the first emperor of this fourth seal. And very briefly, when we looked at the Romphaea, the Thracian sword, we said this fellow came from Thrace. Brothers and sisters, Maximin, the first emperor of the fifth seal, uh, of the fourth seal. Maximin was an absolute monster. Maximin, brothers and sisters, was eight foot six tall. And there he is, this great big monster, this Thracian peasant, walking around, well you don't walk when you're eight foot six tall, brother, you lope. So this great big monster is loping around Thrace. And as he's loping around, brothers and sisters, he wants to impress the emperor. Well, who wouldn't impress you if you were eight and a half foot tall? And he was going to impress Septimus Severus, who at that time, when he was a peasant, he was the emperor. And what Septimus Severus was going to do was to put on a birthday party for his son Gita. And the birthday party was going to be in Thrace. He was going to put on some games, you see. And so what Maximin did, he went up to Septimus Severus and he said, can I go in one of the games and get a coronal wreath? And Septimus said, sure. What game do you want to go in? He said, I want to go into the wrestling match. (laughs) He's this eight and a a half foot bloke. He goes into the wrestling match and he takes on his opponent. Well, one goes over his shoulder, then another one, then 16. He threw 16 to one side, brothers and sisters. This eight and a half foot brute of a bloke, you see. And he turned around to Sir Thomas Severus and said, well, what are you, well, he's gone. Sir Thomas had gone. Sir Thomas hopped on his horse and gone. So there was Maximin running after him, catching up with him. And Sir Thomas Severus said, that wasn't bad. Can you do it again? Sure. Back he goes. Seven more. He was going places, brothers and sisters, and he did. He went up the ranks of the army and he became the emperor. And when he became the emperor, brothers and sisters, if you talked about his peasant stock, if you made fun of him because he was a Thracian peasant, he would do you in like that. He slew thousands upon thousands in one go. He was the Thracian sword. Lay him down. There he is. That's an eight and a half foot Thracian sword. What an amazing thing. And all God says was they would kill by the sword. Well, also they would kill with hunger and death. Now, God, uh, 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 Gibbon says this with respect to this hunger and death. Edward Gibbon. In this period, famine is almost always followed by epidemic diseases. The effect of scanty and unwholesome food, the black period, the black horse period. Other causes may have, however, contributed to the furious plague which from the year 250 AD to 265 raged without interruption in every province, every city and almost in every family of the Roman Empire. Brothers and sisters, during the fourth seal period, half the empire perished. Half the empire. Could you imagine that? Could you imagine half of North America perishing? And don't go to Rome to buy your groceries in this period because not 2,000 perished a day like it did in the red seal. 5,000 people a day in the city of Rome were dying. It was awful, brothers and sisters. It was awful. And therefore, this particular period was hallmarked by death. And the beasts of the earth would also inflict their terrible punishment. Time doesn't permit that we go to Titus 1 and verse 12. You might like to make a note of it. But of course, Paul writing to Titus, talking about those on Crete, liars, slow bellies, evil beasts, They were the men of Crete. And these beasts were the barbarians that would sweep down from the Rhine and the Danube and also the Persians as they would come in from the east and 
and, and, uh, and damage the fair cities of Antioch and of Alexandria. Well, brothers and sisters, there are some of the emperors of the fourth seal. There's Maximin and there is Diocletian, the last emperor of the fourth seal. Diocletian was the greatest emperor to sit upon the throne of Rome since Octavian Augustus, the emperor at the birth of Jesus Christ. This man was going to achieve things that few emperors had ever achieved in the past. And we read, brothers and sisters, with respect to this fourth seal, that it would be 68 years of murder, disease and famine. Now, I'm going to move through this very quickly, time being the enemy. We're going to do some cutting and pasting. In comes, brothers and sisters, at the end of the fourth seal, in comes Diocletian, the first emperor of the fifth seal. Funny man, Diocletian, could not understand the Christians, could not understand them. He didn't want to persecute them. He knew that if you persecuted the Christians, he did in, in the end, mind you, but he knew that if you did it, it would make them more intense in their bow bending. He did not want to make martyrs out of them. He wanted the Christians to encompass in his fold and therefore he said to himself, I could see him walking up and down in his home with his wife, what is wrong with these fundamentalists? What is wrong with these Christians? Why don't they go to our, our, our festivals and buy our trinkets? Why don't they engage themselves in the activities that we engage ourselves in? Why don't they go to a baseball match and stand up and sing the national anthem? Why can't they stand up and salute the flag? We go down to Egypt and worship the god Isis. The Egyptians come up to us. They worship our god. Plenty of gods to go around. We'll accept the Christian god if they will only accept ours. He did not want to persecute them. But he was goaded by his understudy, Galerius. And Galerius said, it's the Christians. It's the Christians. Get rid of the Christians and you'll get rid of the crises. And so he did. He started an intense persecution of our brothers and sisters. And therefore, brethren and sisters, the fifth seal. And when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they hurled. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord? Do you know, brothers and sisters, this is the only place in the apocalypse that they use the word despot. They call God despotes to their brothers and sisters. How long, O despotes? And tomorrow I'll show you why they called God a despot. The only place in the apocalypse. How long dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on those that dwell upon the earth? Well, brothers and sisters, time does not permit we look at that, nor that, nor that. Brothers and sisters, they cried and they were the souls under the altar. We know in Hebrews 13 and verse 10 that Jesus Christ is our altar. We know in Leviticus 4 and verse 7 that they poured the blood at the base of the altar. We know in Galatians chapter 3 that we put on Christ in baptism. We are one in him. Brother Thomas beautifully draws all these three verses together and gives us a wonderful sentence with respect to this fifth seal. He says this, Eureka volume 2, page 238. When the faithful in Christ Jesus, those within the altar... When they die and they return to their parent earth without violence, they are underneath the altar sleeping in Jesus. But if they are made to lie underneath the altar by the blood-shedding cruelty of the enemy, their souls are said, as in the language of the fifth seal, to cry with a great or loud voice for the judicial vengeance on the murderers who poured out their soul blood unto death. What an amazing sentence that is. And so, brethren and sisters, they cried with a loud voice. And we finish our study on this note. When they cried with a loud voice, brothers and sisters, our brethren and sisters who lived in this period, we asked the question, how would a man pray in that time period of the awful persecution of Diocletian, who was determined to bring back the glory of pagan Rome, who was determined to embellish the pagan temples, and to get rid of this backwater religion called the Christians, you see. How would a man pray in an arena like that as they poured bitumen over him, tar, and lit him? And as the intense flames went up his body, how would a man pray, brothers and sisters, our brother, a father, a brother to others, a grandfather, how would he pray with those flames inflicting that awful punishment? Would it be the sort of a prayer that halfway through the prayer he would drift off to sleep? 
And how would a woman pray, brothers and sisters? A mother, a daughter, a granddaughter. How would a woman pray, dragged into this arena and facing blood-lusting animals, knowing that when she goes into that arena, she'll never leave. She'll be torn apart by those beasts, much to the delight and the joy of the crowd. And as she went into that arena, she would gag at the stench of entrails and blood. And so awful was the smell in those arenas that they rigged up perfume sprays and they sprayed the audience lest they gag at the stench of that awful spectacle. How would our sister, a woman, pray, brothers and sisters? Would it be the sort of a prayer that halfway through the prayer she would drift off into the mundane things of life? We know something of their world. They know nothing of ours. And one day they're going to come to you when we're at Sinai, they're going to come to you and they're going to ask, how did you overcome? How did you overcome the awful persecution that they know is only the lot of those who follow Jesus Christ? They know nothing else. What are you going to say to them? Well, it was hot at the Bible school and the speakers went too long. Or I went to the meeting and there was a brother that I didn't get on with and I didn't want to face him because he upset me. I didn't like what the sister said about me. Are we going to say that, brothers and sisters? We'll be embarrassed, embarrassed to say that to our brothers and sisters. I'm not saying we have to be dragged through the old, through the arena like they did, but brothers and sisters, we need to really, really align our minds as our brother Philip has been showing us so wonderfully. Align our minds as to where we are. Are we truly following Jesus Christ? Are we truly a witness to him as our brothers and sisters surely were? Well, brothers and sisters, the cry went up, how long and God willing in our study tomorrow we're going to see that God is going to answer that prayer. In our third study, God answers the prayers of the saints and lo, there was a great earthquake, paganism cast out.